Okay, I guess we're ready to start. Uh, and I, I'm going to be honest, I was up at, uh, I, I, my alarm was early. I mean, way before the alarm went off, I was already wide awake and, and asking the Lord about where do I go with this? Where do I go with this big, these big subjects he's been giving me? And uh, uh, all I know is if I can be in the vein of him, it works. And the last weeks, and I hope every week, but I know the last couple weeks that uh, I've, I've been kind of where I am here today, where I have no idea where I'm going to go with it until I get here. And I, it's not because of lack of trying, because I try to whittle it down, whittle it down, whittle it down. And, and I don't want to give them too much. And I don't want to talk too fast. And I do that. I talk fast. And it's usually, you know, no reason it's because I got so much to give you. But I know that less is more. If I can slow down and maybe just give you a few points, it might go home with you. And I, I've always struggled with that, and I still struggle with it. Because what happens, he just downloads these, you know, buffets in me. There's so much he gives me, and then I've got this little bit of time to try to give it to you. So I'm like, Lord... I just need to know what you want today out of this. And so we've jumped into big subjects, but I do know that when I, the last weeks, every week somebody comes up to me and says, that's exactly what I needed. Usually more than one of you. It's like you were talking to me. And even last week we were talking about God being our provider and the harvest. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden your 18 year job just says, we're closing its doors. We're, 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 we're like, whoa. I, I, nobody expects that, but they said, we needed that message today. We needed that. They had no idea maybe, but, but, but you know, what was coming up on them that all of a sudden like, whoa, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just losing, you know, I've been doing this 18 years. Aren't we, God is, there's a lot of unexpected things in life, but again, it reminded us that God is our provider and you guys have been part of the kingdom for a long time, Marty, you're God's child. And, and so these are things that sometimes I think he's, it's timely. It's gotta be timely. So I've been talking about things that Paul has learned that Paul learned and what I call the lab of life. Paul didn't learn these things because he was just feed, sitting at the feet of the, the best teacher of his day, which he did. He didn't just learn these sitting at his parents who were uh, Pharisees and Hebrews of Hebrews. And he had a lot of teaching by good parents. He had the best schooling. And, and when he went to the, to the synagogue and learned, he had learned a lot. He was very skilled in the word. But the things he said, I'm going to have to give the church today was the things that he learned when he was struck down on the road to Damascus. When all of a sudden he has a face-to-face uh, experience with this God that he'd been teach, law, learning about through the law, this Jesus that he had missed him. And now he was persecuting the children of the Messiah. And he realized he was the Christ. And so then he learned them sitting in prisons. He learned them uh, out shipwreck. He learned some things in the, the, the lab of life. Whatever we're going through today, Paul went through it 10 times over, hundred times over. So we've got a man who's not just talking out of his head knowledge. He said, I learned some stuff. And he said, I learned about to how to be content in however I find myself. He found himself in some crazy times like we do. But somehow or another, he learned that, that contentment, contentment with God and this is great gain. He said, this is what gain is in life. It's not how much money you have. It's not the house you live in. It's, he goes, it's, I've learned some stuff about, it's an inside job. It's something on the inside. And then he learned, he also learned that it's okay to be weak. He said, I learned to be weak because when I am weak, that's when I need to become strong because he's strong on my behalf. And when Paul struggled through life, it's obvious that even way down the road, him writing letters, he never had overcome all the sin in his life. He was still weak and depend on God to be strong. In fact, uh, I'm just going to put it up there. We quote it a lot, but Romans 7, 18 through 24. This, this is Paul talking here. And we need to look at this sometimes to realize in our struggles. And, and uh, he said, for I know that is in me that's in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Have you ever felt that way? In my flesh, it's like, when am I going to get it right? Paul felt this way. For to will is present with me. 
but how to perform it that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do not, I, that I good that for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that's what I do. Seriously, Paul? Now, if I do that which I would not, it's no more than me that does it, but it's sin that dwells in me. What he says, he goes, I realize I still have some sin in me. I still have some sinful things in me. And then I found a law that when I would do good, evil is still present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. How many of y'all, that's you? You delight after the ways of God inside. You want to do what's right. When I'm teaching on Sunday, you're like, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Oh, I want to give more. I want to serve more. I want to, I want to love more. I want to do the right thing. In the, inside, I'm, so, I'm serving this, this, this law of God inside me, the, what God wants in the inward man. But I see another law in my members. <laughs> Warring against the law of my mind. Bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man am I, who is going to deliver me from this body of death? Then he answers it and he said, it's going to be Jesus is going to deliver me. But isn't it something to look at Apostle Paul writing this years down the road? He said, even though inside I've got it inside, man, I've got treasure. But I got to remember, as he said one time, he put this treasure in an earthen vessel. I'm still dirt on the outside. I still in that earth vessel. And then he said, why did he leave us in an earthen vessel? Why did he, I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, why didn't you, I'm gold inside. I am so gold inside. I want to do, there's, I don't want to do anything wrong. I love you in my heart. I love your people. I want to serve you. I said, but, but on the outside, I still have this other warring going on, but I don't want to get up or I don't want to like that person or I don't want to, you know, there's that don't want to. And I said, God, why don't you just make me gold on the outside like you did on the inside? Because he said he put treasure in the earth and vessel. And he goes, like, go back and read it. Then the rest of it, he said, he tells you why. He goes, so he left us in dirt so that the glory would be of him and not of ourselves. See, if Paul had it all together and he was just as gold on the outside as he was on the inside, then he would think he was doing it. But God leaves us in this vessel so we would know all glory goes to him. And when I am weak, he is strong. And I can know that all glory or all credit goes to him. He said, I see this. So what the third thing I already taught a little bit on, and I taught a message called the grace that Paul learned. Because the third thing was, he learned the graciousness of God. The word grace means graciousness. That God was good. God was gracious. He had him covered while he was still doing this. See, we think grace is the, we, some reason, somewhere along the line, maybe everybody doesn't, but we thought, I thought grace was the, he gives me the grace to do it. I thought that means he gives me the power to overcome sin. And then I felt like, what's wrong with me? Because I'm still sinning. No, that wasn't about the grace to cover because he said, I'm still dealing with some sinful things that's still in me. I still have some stuff that's in me that I haven't overcome yet. But he learned grace was not the power to stop sinning. Grace was what covered him while he was learning to stop sinning. Grace is what covered him in the process. Grace had him covered while he still had a war in his members. Grace is a covering. It's that time that covers you while you're still in this. Grace says, I got you covered. Because you're not going to get it together all, all at one time. In fact, you will live and die and never have perfection in your flesh. We're going to constantly be learning how to overcome stuff, right? Because I get over one thing and something else happens. And this is a part of this journey that he will say, every time you're weak, I'm going to be strong. And you're going to see you need me. And you're going to see how good and gracious and merciful I am. You see, what he, one scripture, he said, what if he let the whole world be in disobedience just so he could show his mercy to the whole world? See, that's why he's wanting to show his, y'all, this whole experience is knowing God. I'm going to know him in his love. I'm going to know him in his mercy. I would never need to know him in mercy if I didn't have these problems that Paul had. 
I wouldn't need mercy because mercy is what I need when I'm guilty. And I'm like, you've given me mercy. And they said, oh, not only I'm giving you mercy and you didn't get what you deserved, but I'm going to give you grace and you're going to, you're going to get, you're going to get something good. I still get the favor of God upon my life, even when I don't deserve it. That's what we call grace, unmerited favor. It just means he's covering us though. When I, when I'm still in my struggle, does that make sense? That's a, that's something he revealed to me lately. Grace is the covering while you're not, while you're still sinning. It's while you're still having a problem. And his mercy is right there with you the whole time. And by his mercy, he gives us grace. His mercy endures forever is a phrase that's in the Bible over 50 times. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. You can read it over and over and his mercy endures forever. And it's by his grace. It's got us covered. It's by his grace. We have mercy in the middle of our struggles. And so Paul said, um, second Corinthians nine and eight. He says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that, that you have an all sufficiency and all things may abound into every good work. Now, last week, the last two weeks I've been talking about, he said, God is not forgetful to forget. He's not unfaithful to forget your labor of your work and your labor of love. He said, I want you to abound in every good work. And God's going to give you the grace to do those good works. And when you do it, even though people forget it, God don't forget it. God don't forget anything you ever did for him, anything you ever gave to him, any bit of mercy you gave, any bit of money, any bit of forgiveness. All those things are in the same thing. So we can make it about money. Oh, money's important, aren't we? Glad he blesses us in that way. And we want that. But more than just money, he said, I want you to be bountiful in grace and mercy and forgiveness. Because what you give, that's what you get back. But you don't just get back what you gave. You get more than what you sowed. We learned that, the harvest. You get more than you sowed. In fact, I'm going to shake it down. I'm going to run it. It's going to run over. He's able to make all grace abound toward you that you have an all sufficiency in all things. I love those alls. All sufficiency in all things abound to every good work. Grace is a wonder. Grace is an awesome thing. Grace is amazing. He said he'll make all grace a boundary. He's just going to cover you so that you will be sufficient. And when Brother Sam, all of a sudden, he's having to do the songs they were going to do, uh, they're not doing them no more. And he's up here doing the guitar and singing all by himself. But God's grace, and he covered him, and he was able to just, he said, I'll just do it, Lord. But he goes, now nah, he gives me all sufficiency to do the things I need to do. He will make it sufficient. But I want to tell you, if y'all don't learn the grace message, every time you step up and start trying to do something for God, the enemy, the lying liar will start telling you that you're not worthy. Look what you did. You didn't pray enough. Look, you cussed that person. Look, you did this. You lusted. You did that. You did this. And all of a sudden you feel like, I just don't think I can do that, Pastor. I can't do all things through good works because I know what I am and I know I'm still failing. Well, join Paul. Paul's pretty good company to be in. I still have some issues. Aren't we glad God doesn't wait to use you to do good things until you don't have any issues? We're going to have issues. You're going to have, you're going to have arguments. With your spouse, you're going to have problems with your kids. You're going to have fallouts with some of your family members. You're going to have issues at work and you're not always going to get it right. But I can still do all things when I understand grace that he's got me covered. And when I am weak, then that's when he's strong. These are things that Paul, Paul learned. Oh my God. If you don't learn grace, what does it really mean? And, oh, I could teach on this, but here's what the Lord, at the end of, I don't know how far I can go with this, because I've just got, got pages. But at the end of the last message, when I talked about the grace that Paul learned, I'm not going to go back and teach that one, uh, but I said grace is like a, um, having a grace period. And I said, so if you have your rents due on the first and your, your, your landlord says, well, it's due on the first, but I'm going to give you a grace period till the 10th. And so at the 10th, if you don't have it paid by then, then there is what? A late fee, a penalty. 
So that first to the 10th, my water bill's like that. It comes up, Woodbine Water, and it says, if you pay it by this date, this is your water bill. But if you pay it after this date, that's your water bill. So there's a penalty, but in the middle of the penalty, even though it's due on the first, if I still have 10 days grace period, grace period, and so I'm still covered. But after the grace period is, now if I didn't pay it, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a late fee. And if I wait too long, get cut off, then I get a reconnection fee. And that's another $50 you don't want to pay. So that's, that's how the world, there's a grace period. And I had said that using that word to explain a covering. There's a grace period, right? You're covered through that time. But after I left here that day, I heard something in my spirit. I heard him say, it's not a grace period. It's grace period. It's grace, comma, period. Oh, whoa. I've been chewing on that one. I can do a lot of study. I can do a lot. But when I get those little nudges from the Holy Spirit, I stop and pay attention. And I can find myself, because that's been three weeks ago that I preached that, made that message. I'm chewing on that. What do you mean, Lord? It's grace, period. It's not about, I don't have a grace period on you. It's grace, period. We have grace periods we give to each other, and it's, there's a limit on it. I'm giving you grace for that, but after that, buddy. Somebody said, hit me on one cheek, you know. Turn the cheek, hit you on that cheek, then what happened? He didn't tell you what to do after that one. That grace period's over. <laughs> it's, it's going down right there. But we want to give grace periods. Maybe if we're merciful. But he said, my grace, it's grace period. There's no end to that. And so I'm like, well, I, don't, I, I have to look through my theology and figure out what that means. And so I can't get to all of it, but I can, I'm going to first say this, where there's, there's two realms, there's two realms. There is the heavenly realm, right? And there's the earthen realm. There is the kingdom down here. Boy, I, I was going to put my board up here. I probably should, but I've been, I taught this back in 2018. I really taught on the kingdom of God the whole year. And, uh, but there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I think it was Matthew called it the kingdom of heaven. Everybody else called it the kingdom of God. And then there's the kingdom of. It's the kingdom of man. This world. Oh, we. Oh, I can't get off on this because this is a whole teaching. But I can get on Wednesdays if y'all want to be a part of it. The kingdom of man and the versus the kingdom of God. People want to act like it's the kingdom of Satan versus. No, Satan ain't versus God. God he ain't his. That's not his rival. He made the angel. No, it's the kingdom of man down here. And Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion. It's man. He gave us command. We have dominion here. And we're influenced by Satan. He tries to influence. He ain't got no kingdom. The only thing he can do is try to take a kingdom in my mind and try to control me. And I can try to give him. But he ain't got no kingdom. He, 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 God, he's not king. He's prince of power there. He's not king. God is king. And he is, he, there's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of man. Or the kingdom of me. As I taught for a long time. The kingdom of me. And so that's why I submit my will to his will. That means I cast my crowns at his feet. Because my crowns is my authority, my will, my victories, and I give them to him. And so that's that. This is the whole thing. I'm versing every day. Am I going to walk in the kingdom of me, this world, kingdom of Pam, do it my way? Or am I stop in the morning and say, Lord, no, not my will, but your will be done. I bow my kingdom to you. You have your way today. Oh, I just threw y'all for a loop. Some of y'all didn't get my teaching in 2018. But we'll talk about these two kingdoms. And so there's a kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of the heavenly realm. It's where God lives. It's where the angel, it's right amongst us. It's a dimension. This kingdom of God is a dimension. It's right here. In fact, he said, don't look and see. Don't say it's here or there. Where is the kingdom of God now? It's in me. 
It's in me. So this kingdom, I'm, I'm relating now. I have this kingdom in me and I also have the kingdom of Pam and the same thing. I'm dealing with the two war in my members, the kingdom of God that's telling me I want to do this and I live for God out of the inward man. Or I have the kingdom of Pam who wants to do what Pam does. And Apostle Paul said, oh, wretched man am I. I'm, I'm, I'm twixt between two kingdoms. I'm who's going to rule today. Who is going to win today? What's the old saying? The one you feed the most is the one that wins. Okay, so that's the truth. Am I going to, am I going to let the kingdom of God or the kingdom of man? And so, boy, this is not in here, but I guess I had to say that. Because there's two kingdoms. And let me tell you something. In the kingdom of God, it's grace, period. In that realm, it's grace, period. But down here, so let me just read you some scriptures here that talk about because in that kingdom it's all grace in that kingdom our sin is covered we're covered from heaven's view for second corinthians 5 14 and 15 5 uh 14 through 15 for the love of christ constrains us because this we judge that if one died for all then all were dead but he that died for all that we should not live this for to ourselves, but to him that died for us. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5th chapter 14 and 15. So he says, if God died, he, Jesus did, he, what did he do? He died for all that he would, that now we don't have to live for ourselves, but to him that died for us. As he died for us, he died as us. He died on our behalf. And then he says, he died one for all, then all were dead. So if Christ died, we're all dead. But now he said he's, we've risen with back with him when he rose. He said, no, we don't have to live for ourselves anymore. To the love of Christ constrains us. Or you, I just read that down. If he died for all, they which should not live for themselves should live but them that rose. Okay, go to the next one. Let's go down to 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To what God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ reconciling his world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And now he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. So he says now because of what Christ did, God doesn't impute our sin to the world. He imputes now sin onto who? Jesus took the sin of the world, right? Do we not sing the song, Jesus paid it all? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sin, trespasses to them. And now he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. We're now supposed to go tell everybody what Jesus did. We're supposed to go tell everybody that God has already reconciled and put the sin of the world on his son, Jesus. Right? Y'all kind of know this. So let's jump down to this next one. I'm jumping into some scriptures here. First John 2, 1 through 2. I love this scripture. My little children, these things are right unto you that you sin not. I don't want you sinning. I don't want you. And we're going to talk about what sin is here in a minute. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins, not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. The whole world. I don't want you sinning, but if you do sin, you already have a, a go-between. You have an advocate. When God looks at the world, what does he see? He sees the blood of his son. He sees Jesus. Jesus died these are over and over, and I'm just saying something y'all probably already know, but I had to say this. Because in that world, it's all grace. It's all grace from that. He is the perpetuation for our sins, not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. He's already taken care of the world. From heaven's view, he looks down, and it's been covered with the blood of Jesus. He's already the go-between. I don't want you sinning, but here if you do sin, and we are going to sin, he said you already have somebody in between you. You already have a go-between. You have an advocate. He's already there. Yeah, it said, I plead the blood of Jesus. It's like the attorney said, I plead the fit. He's pleaded the blood of Jesus over you. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But Christ has become the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands that say of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus became the last high priest, went in there. He's not only the, the high priest that 
that uh, slayed the lamb, the last lamb that the, 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 the Jews understood every year. The priests would go in there and slay the lamb and roll their sins away for another year. But now Jesus became the high priest. Not only he was the high priest, but he also became the sacrificial lamb. He was both the lamb and the slayer of the lamb. Neither by blood of goats and calves, by his own blood, he entered once the holy place, obtained an eternal, which means spiritual, a redemption for us. This is what he did for the world. Jesus came and he paid the price. He said, this is why I can say it's, it's grace, period. It's grace, period. I've already done the work. I came in here. No longer is it a priest going to come and roll their sins away for another year. But now here's what John the Baptist saw when he saw his cousin Jesus walk. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He didn't just, he took it away, guys. The sin, singular sin, that sin thing that we got from Adam that we all inherited, he took that away. He became not just to roll it away. He removed that stain of sin off of the world once for all. He came once for all. It don't ever happen again. You can find all through Hebrews. It's, it's the last, it was the last sacrifice. Galatians 1, 3, 4, 4, through 4, 3 and 4, 1, 3 and 4. Grace be to you. Oh, hallelujah for grace. And peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Aren't we glad he's not just redeeming us for the eternal life, but he's redeeming us from this evil world right now? Okay, so in the heavenlies, it's grace, period. Great. He's already paid the price. I could, there's a hundred more scriptures that say that. It's all through there what he's got us covered in that eternal realm. Eternal just means the spirit realm. It's that dimension where God is, which all is now. But guys, what I do understand is, oh, let me just read this one. I've got to read this one. Romans 5, 17 through 20. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, that's Adam, how much more do we receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in one life by Christ Jesus? If by Adam that happened, if Jesus, how much more, how much more the gift of grace, the abundance of grace and righteousness reign? Therefore, as by offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, that's Adam, even so by righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. Okay. I'm just going to be reading this from here. What have I got up there? That's 1920. Now hang on. So, but moreover, go on to 20, moreover, the law entered that the fence may abound or sin abounded, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter how much you sin, guys, grace abounds more. You cannot out sin grace. Where sin abounded, grace much more did abound bound. Well, let me go down to six and one. So what shall we say then? Shall we just continue in sin that grace abound? Should we just keep on sinning? Oh, the Lord just got me covered. So I'm just going to keep on doing it. He's I'm saved by grace. I'm just going to keep on acting like a heather. We well, he said, what, go to that next one, that five, uh, six and one, I think it is. He said, should we just keep sinning? The grace abounds, six and one. God forbid, how should we the dead to sin live there any longer? Know you not that as many of us were baptized to Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, we were baptized to his death. So he said, why am I going to just keep on doing it? So he's saying, what's wrong with your heart if you just want to keep sinning? Well, God's got me. God, what kind of life are you going to have if you just say, well, God got grace, so I'm just going to keep on acting like I'm acting. First of all, what's wrong with your heart? Have you really give your life to God if that's your attitude? Why do you want to continue in sin? He said, why would you? 
If you've buried yourself in, with him and you said, my life is your life. I want to rise up to walk in newness of life, he said. Why, why would I want to do that if I, if, if because of grace? So he goes on down here. I'm going to just, I'm jumping through some scriptures. I hope you're hanging with me. So we invert, and so we're going down here to 12, 6 and 12. He said, therefore, don't let sin reign in your body that you should obey the lust thereof. Don't let it have its reign. Don't let it control you. Fight the fight against it. Paul had problems, but he said, I'm still fighting the good fight. I'm not just going, well, let's just have, how many I heard people say, that's just how I am. Well, don't you want to grow up? You just want to keep doing that? How's it working for you? Well, I know I'm a liar. I'm just going to keep being a liar. It's not going to be a very good life for you either. So don't let sin that you should obey the desires of that. Neither yield your members as instruments as unrighteousness and to sin, but yield yourself to God by as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Don't let sin have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. He said, don't you know that those you give your body to, you're, you become a servant to it. If you keep giving yourself, it becomes a slave. You become a slave to what you gave yourself to. You start off, I just need that pill, or I just need that woman, or I just need that. And what better need for a minute, you keep yielding yourself to do it, and you, all of a sudden it's got you. You needed that drink maybe just to calm your nerves. Or maybe you just needed to go shopping again, do a little shop uh, uh, therapy. Well, we have all kinds of stuff that we can use. But all of a sudden you keep doing it. What happens? He said, you just keep doing things that it, he said, before you know it, it becomes, you become a slave to it. And it now it's controlling you. But thank God for his grace. He said, uh, I'm going to just jump on down here. Uh, Titus 2, 11, 15. For the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for a blessed hope and the glorious appearing of great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he could redeem us from all iniquity. This is what he already did. He already redeemed us from iniquity, purify himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works, Speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority these things. So let me say this. What am I saying here? In this, this realm, he's got us covered. But guys, down here in this realm, down here we walk, you just keep sinning and see what happens. Because what is sin? My easiest thing I tell kids that sin is, is, is anything that's harmful. Sin is things that's harmful for me or other people. Sin is things. Think about it. He never takes anything good from us. He only asks us to give up things that are harmful. It's harmful things. You can tell your kids, sin is things that's harmful for you and other people. We don't want to be liars. We don't want to be stealers. We don't want to be killers. We don't, we want, these are things that they're harmful to people. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something happened in this church here some years ago. My daughter was here, but when they were they were elders here and she was teaching Sunday school my oldest daughter Joda and they was in the Sunday school class and she asked the class and these were a little I don't know how what age they was but she said uh what is sin and the little girl jumped up and said sin is when you stab somebody in the neck when they're driving a car That's pretty specific. <laughs> and so when they laugh, one of the older girls was talking because her mother told him, she goes, now we say, what is sin? It's when you stab somebody in the neck when they're driving a car. Kids have some funny ways, don't they? But sin is a little more than just stabbing somebody in the neck when they're driving a car. Sin is anything that's harmful for us down here. 
So if you have a father that's a good father and you've got kids that are stabbing each other in the neck when they're driving, father might come in and say, I love you. I'm going to chastise you. You can't stab people in the neck while they're driving. When you stop, maybe. But we don't wreck the whole car. So sin down here is a little different than sin up there. He already covered the sin from heaven's view. But down here, we still have sin. And so what he's, and he's saying, uh, and so down here, it's, it's a little different picture. In fact, he said, he that he loves, he corrects. So let me tell you something. You just keep doing this kind of stuff and see what happens with father. Because what you're going to have is then this time you're going to have a grace period. A grace period. Because here's like, it's funny, this is son funny too, another little kid. My little nephew, my great nephew, my brother's little grandson, he was two. He's, that kid come out of the womb talking, I think. He is the most verbal child. But he was getting in trouble. I don't know what he's doing. And, and my brother Kelly said, okay, Rhett, I'm fixing to count to tw three. I'm counting to three and you better do that. So he started saying one, two, and little Rhett said, stop. Papa K, I do not know how to count. I don't know how to count. One, two. I don't know how to count. We still, the kid was two and said, I don't know how to count. That was hilarious. That kid's smart. I pro he probably did not get in trouble after that one because that grace period was one, two, three. One, two, three. You're, you've had it. There is a grace period down here, I promise you. God is going to let you go so far with your sin. You hurting people and hurting yourself. He's going to say, I'm going to count to three. You better. Mm, sometimes he counts to 10. Sometimes he's so mercy, his, he feels like it just endures forever. But by his mercy, he's going to stop and say, if you've got a child that's continuing to self-destruct or destruct other children, you better expect Father God to stand up off that throne. You may notice when Stephen was being stoned to death, what did he see in the heavens? He saw Jesus standing. Other places he's sitting, he stood up. I think Father stands up when one of y'all are getting hurt. He stood to attention. You just keep doing stuff. You just keep doing your sin. I've got them covered. Oh, you're covered all right. Up there in the heavenly realm, his grace, it's grace period. But down here, sometimes there's a grace period. And he says, you keep doing that. And I'm going to have to give you some discipline, some correction. And however many, how many in the house has ever had some correction from the father? You got both hands raised back there, David, don't you? It's by his mercy, he will yank you up. Sister Carol says, he grabs me by the collar. He grabs me by the collar. In fact, there's a scripture that talks about willful sin. Have you ever heard that scripture about willful sin? Hebrews 10, 26, 27. For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour our adversaries. What adversary is he talking about? Is he talking about our enemy there? What adversaries is he going to destroy out of us? Or I just give the hint. It's what's in me. It's my pride. It's my shame. It's those things that Paul said I still have in my members that he's going to have to purify if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge. In other words, you ever had your kids say, I, you knew better. That's another thing to have a kid that don't know better. There's a, there's a story about that in the Bible. There's two servants. One of them didn't, didn't know and didn't do the father's will. And the other one did know the father's will and didn't do it. He said, what's going to happen? The one gets beat with stripes, the other one gets more stripes. So in other words, there's God's looking at things and how he disciplines is different because he sees your heart and he sees your motive. But he said, if all of a sudden God has been dealing with you on some stuff and you just say, no, I'm not going to do it. And you willfully, in other words, he says, there's no for a sacrifice or sin. Does that mean you can never come back? 
No, that's what it sounds like, but you got to put all scriptures together. But he's saying, you're just not covered by that. If there's a grace covering, it's just God is covered. But there's times when you're going along with life, you're trying to do the best thing, you're trying to do things, but you just keep missing the mark. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But he's got to cover. But you walk over here like this. This is the grace covering. And then all of a sudden, I know better, and I just do it deliberately. He said, ooh, you're fixing to get a certain whooping. Because you knew better and I've been giving you grace and it didn't work. And now you're stepping on my grace. He said, you're just trodden on me going, it don't really matter. I'm going to keep on hurting those people. I'm going to keep on lying and stealing and doing whatever. I'm going to keep on whatever I'm doing. Gossiping, the worst thing you could ever do. But right here, he says, there's no sacrifice. Not, but I'm, I'm sending it. It's just not covered right there. Not because in the heavenlies, it's already, everything is already removed by Jesus. But down here, there's no covering. So you can be sure if you're willfully doing it, he's going to come to attention and he's going to take care of your issues. Does that make sense? Now, some of y'all tell me, what am I? There's a difference in a not willful sin and a willful sin. I know better. And he's just going... I'm, that's why one person in church can do a sin and you don't seem like nothing ever happened. Another person like, whoa, what happened to that? It's because they knew better and this and didn't know better. But his mercy is still there with us. But he knows how to deal with us individually. It's in the life lab, in the lab of life. You're having to learn some stuff. And you're learning your father is faithful and knows he loves, he chastises. Because he said, I can't have you keep on doing these things, hurting one another and destroying yourself. You got a kid that keeps playing with matches? Playing with knives? If you love them longer, if you're going to go, no, we're not going to get another pocket knife. You're going to grow a little bit more before grandpa gives you another pocket knife. Because you, you, my brother got a pocket knife when he was young. I, oh, mom, tell off on him. He's not here today. Kelly, help you, gorgeous. He got a pocket knife. And me and my, I don't know why I'm telling this. Me and my friend, we had a, he got a tent. And mom and dad let us stay out in the yard in his tent. He didn't want us girls to stay in his tent. That's his tent. He came out there and I, I don't know how he did it, but he had that little pocket knife. He actually, I don't know if he meant to, but he stabbed my friend in the hand. That boy got such a whooping, and he never, he didn't get a knife for years. Sometimes we just can't handle a knife as a kid. Sometimes you just got to grow up a little bit. It's like, no, you can't have that. It's by his mercy, and it's by, in this grace, he gives you a grace period. Oh, my goodness. I guess I'm going to talk about the grace period next time. But he says, there is a certain, I'm telling you, there's some things he's just going to deal with you. But aren't, aren't we glad he does that? Because he is so, he is so gracious. Guys, the one thing, oh my goodness. Mm. How can I just close this without going to this, not frustrating the grace of God? I got, I got to tell you this, though. I just told you what. This is really important right here. I taught on this at one point. I used to, I had the words up on the screen because I'm not going to say them right. Leonard knows more pronunciation of Greek and Hebrew than I do. But I keep talking about the word sin. I need to tell you all, there's two words for sin in the Bible. If you don't know this, it's, it's life-changing when you really understand it. Um, there's two words. One of them is, is really the, the word that's from the Old Testament that, that uses, uh, that these are both, I'm giving you the New Testament deal, but they both, the Old Testament word for sin was to disobey the law or disobey God. That was what sin was, right? You sinned, uh, it's way in the garden. They disobeyed what God said. It's sin, it was disobeying God. And then there was the law came along and now you're disobeying the law of God that was given us to Moses. So it's even more sin because now you have law. He said, we didn't even really know sin until we got the law, but sin really wasn't imputed until the law. So now you had a, a repercussion. So if you killed, uh, this is what happens. It's eye for eye, tooth for tooth and all this stuff. So then they got this law and that is the word sin, um, which is hamartia. If that's the right way, it's like that, but it's, it's the word for sin. There's another word that's close, but it's very different. And it's where we are today. 
The word for sin back then was disobeying the law. But now that he fulfilled the law, I didn't say that Jesus come to fulfill the law. He didn't do away with it, but he fulfilled it. What does that mean? He fulfilled it. it means he did everything. He, he, did, he obeyed the law, every single bit of the law. He obeyed it. He lived the perfect life. And then what did he do? He put it on the account of the world. I already read that. He gave it to us. He now put it on our account. He lived the perfect life, put it on our account. He said he became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. So now he looks at us. There's that grace thing he's got us covered. He knew no, he, he, he knew no sin. He became our sin. I lost my place right there. I hate it when I do that. Somebody's, I, I veered off. I had a thought I was going there with that. But I'm talk. do what? Two words for sin. Tim, I'm, I'm, te I'm testing you all to see if you're paying attention. Do y'all want to what? To obey a law. Okay. You're with me. Jesus fulfilled the law. He put it on our account. Okay. We're getting there. He paid it all. Okay. No charge. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go back to that, but let me just finish the other word then. Because it was a th thought I was going to, but that's okay. It'll come back. Um, the first word of sin is, is in the law. So he fulfilled that. Okay. But then, oh, okay, and Jesus lived the perfect life, put it on our account. The second word is now in the New Testament, really what it means. It's hamantano, which means to miss the mark. In the Old Testament, it was the sin. It was to disobey the law. But now Jesus already fulfilled the law. And put it on our account. So now we're not accountable to that kind of sin. Now the sin on this side, y'all, means to miss the mark and to so not share in the prize. I wish I had my board. Y'all need to get this. This is the sin you're dealing with right now. Melinda, he's not looking at you and going, oh, you sinned, you disobeyed the law. No, no. Jesus paid for that. But here's the deal. When we sin, he calls it missing the mark. If I had a bullseye up here, the Bible said there is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Say ring, ring, ring. The middle is perfect will of God. Bullseye. Didn't in what you want, the bullseye. We want to hit the bullseye. But so many times our heart, we're, we're fulfilling the Lord after the inward man, right? We're doing that. But then all of a sudden I just miss the mark. Miss the mark. Even if you just hit the outer rim, the good, he said, I'll take all things and work it for your good. So if you're just aiming for it, he said, you're aiming. But so many times we're aiming. Paul said, I'm trying to reach the perfect mark. I press toward the mark, the high calling of God. We are all of us trying to get it right. And you're just trying to get it right. If your heart is after him. And even if I miss it. I did not mean to talk about that person. I didn't mean to do that. I did, But I'm striving. But he said now to sin is to miss the mark. It's not about the law. Oh you disobeyed God. No that law. That sin's already been paid down here. But what I'm having to live with every day. Is am I missing the mark or not? Because when I miss the mark. Means I don't share the prize of the perfect will of God. Mm. I'm missing out on the prize, which is the high calling. I want to do his best. I want to get his best, right? So when I am aiming, all he needs us to do on this side as his children is just keep aiming. Just keep trying to do the right thing. Asking God, walking with God. And when I sin, it's because I've missed the mark today. All have sinned. That word right there is all has missed the mark. When he says the scripture, and there's a whole bunch of them, I think, I think I found 50 something where this word is used in the New Testament. Miss the mark. It's different than I disobeyed the law. 
Okay, that has been fulfilled. Jesus completed that for us. He fulfilled the law. And so, but he's now on this side means to not share the prize. I, I miss for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All has missed the mark. And they missed out on the prize of the best. When I realize that it has changed so much in my life, when I think about my sin, I don't think, oh, oh, I've sinned. I fell. I, di I didn't know. It's like, oh, I missed the mark. If I'd have done it that way, that was the good path. But even if I miss it way over here and I just totally blew it, he said, I'll still take all things together. Even your faults and your failures, I will take them and work them for your good if you just stay with me. Quit condemning yourself and don't fall out over it. I, I, I do it again. I, I messed up again. I miss the mark again. Can y'all start using that word? Have you ever heard miss the mark? Old, old timers know it. I missed the mark. There, that's the Bible. That's the word for sin. Look it up. Oh, you sinner, you. Oh, you missed the marker, you. <laughs> I miss you, Mark. <laughs> I don't want to miss the mark. I'm striving for the bullseye. Jackson, you got that baby girl now needing her daddy to hit the bullseye. You just keep aiming. Your heart, Apostle Paul, I serve him in the inward man. Even though, oh, wretched man am I. I'm so glad he's got me covered with that law business. He's already become the propitiation for my sin up there. But down here, but down here, he will deal with me with my sin. He deals with it now, y'all. It's different than over there. We're, oh, you're going to sin. You're going to go do all this over there. Why would he have to deal with it over there? He's dealing with it right now. He says there's a fiery judgment. The word judgment means a decision. Do you not know that he said we appear before the judgment seat of Christ every day? What's that mean? The word judgment means decision. Every day, y'all have heard me say this before. Every day, he's looking at his children. As a good king, the king would sit and have his subjects come and he would say, what do you need today? And they come before him. I need you to avenge this person for me. They, they stole from me. Would you give them? They come and do business. The king does business on the behalf of his kingdom. God is doing business. He's a good father. He's watching out with his kids. He's like, oh, you need a reward. I need to tell them a good job or they need a little discipline. Every day, we're not waiting for something over there. Every day he's looking at me, not judging me like, oh, well, sometimes he's doing that with me. Like, oh my God, there she goes again. I know that don't happen with you, Clint. You, do, you got it together over there. He's looking at us because he loves us. He's looking at his creation. He already covered you. And he said, now you're mine. Now I, you're coming before the judgment, the decision uh, of every day I come before him and he's making judgments on my behalf. Do they need some correction? Do they need some blessing to have, have let me do some abundance. They need some abundance of grace because sin abounds, must grace, much more abound. Gabriel, you better go cover them extra today. Does that give y'all a different view? I hope you're getting a different view of grace. And sin. Now he sees us as missing the mark. We're children that's already his. And he's got good stuff for us. He's got good stuff for us. I, I'm, I may can get to it next week. I'm going to close. But I'm, I want to talk about the grace period that he gave the Jews. He gave them 40 years. He gave them a grace period. Two times. He gave it to them in the wilderness. Between the Israel and Egypt in the promised land, the kingdom, 40 years. It took them one day to get Egypt out of them, but took 40 years. It got one day they took Egypt, them out of Egypt, took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And those that was able to do it, they reached the kingdom level. They was able, they, they were all God's children. They were all saved, they delivered, but they had not reached that kingdom level yet. A production that we talked about last week, they hadn't got there, but he gave them a 40 year time to deal with it. 
Well, the same thing happened when Jesus stood before the Jews when he got there. He said, I'm going to give you one generation. I'm going to give you 40 years. A generation is 40 years. And there's not going to be one stone left on the other. I'm going to destroy this temple. One generation. And he did it. 70 AD. He gave him a grace period of 40 years. And it's really significant about what's happening with us to even in our world today. But he gave those Jews and he said, this is what's going to happen. And he gave them 40 years to get the old covenant, 2,000 years now of Moses' law in them. And he was trying to bring them over into a grace period. And they could not see it. And they kept falling from grace, he said. They fell from grace. What does that mean? They fell back from the grace message back to the law message. They kept going back. Wanting to go back and obey the law again. He said, you're falling from grace again. Grace is better than that. You don't have to go back and start trying to obey me. You now can, bless her heart, I just got loud. It scared the baby. Grace period. It was a grace period he gave them. And then had the destruction of Jerusalem. And now we're watching them today trying to rebuild the temple mount that was, delivered, was destroyed in 70 A.D. So I'm going to leave you hanging on that. Hopefully y'all going to be back next week. And we'll give you a little more teaching on that. Or I'm going to do some on Wednesday. Not this Wednesday because we have prayer. But the next Wednesday after that. These are really relevant things. And have y'all understood a little bit more about grace today? I hope you did. I just touched on it.